in the weeks and months leading up to W Day here on Guam, uh, the fact that there was going to be an American invasion of this island, or at least an attempt, well, it was no secret to the Japanese. They, they knew that it was going to happen at some point. So there was a lot of effort by the Japanese during their occupation of Guam to, to defend this island and, and fortify it against the coming American invasion. Well, right now, we are in a village called Piti here on Guam, which isn't too far from the, the northern invasion beach where we started off. And uh, we are going to be taking a look, whew, <laughs> after we get up this steep hill, at one of the gun emplacements of the Japanese here. Before we continue on up this hill, I just kind of want to take a look around here and show what an amazing looking place this is. This is a uh, mahogany forest here on Guam. Uh, these trees I think were planted back in the 1920s, if I'm not mistaken. And man, walking through here, it, you know, from a guy who is coming from, from the Midwest. It's, it's just a, a different world. Uh, so incredibly cool. And uh, I also think that Guam might have the highest uh, concentration of chickens per square mile uh, than any other place that I've ever been. I don't know if you can hear them, but man, uh, there are roosters crowing all over the place and I have seen chickens all over this island. All right, we're gonna get on up here to these gun emplacements. All right, now, in this particular place, there are three Japanese guns that were overlooking the northern invasion beaches. And here is one of them. And dang, that thing is an absolute beast huh now to, to the best of my understanding uh, these guns were all naval guns uh, so they would have originally been designed for like a, a Japanese battleship but were brought up here and uh, repurposed as a coastal defense gun and man, getting this thing up here must have been a chore. Look at that thing. The National Park Service has a, a little bit of signage here to help us understand what we're looking at. And I'm glad that they, they do have that because I'm uh, always wanting to, to learn. Uh, what we are looking at right here is a 14 centimeter, which is about a 5.5 inch, uh, coastal defense gun uh, has a range of 10.6 miles so this would have you, you can't see because of the vegetation right now uh, but this would have been overlooking uh, Arpa Harbor uh, which the the Japanese reasonably assumed was going to be a target for the American invasion all right we're gonna see what else we can find here should be two more guns up here Well, I don't know if you can tell it or not, but uh, I, I am absolutely just uh, sweating my tuchus off right now. It is insanely hot and it's morning. It's not even midday. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got off the plane here in the North Marianas and started sweating and I haven't stopped. Uh, so I can imagine just 
how backbreaking and excruciatingly painful it must have been to to get these guns up here but it wasn't the japanese actually who were bringing the guns up and doing the labor themselves they were pressing the local chamora people into doing all of this labor ah uh, so man that must have been something else I, i've heard a theory uh, they, they don't know how they got them up here um but it's thought that maybe they got logs and then you know rolled them up but like if you I don't know if you can really tell, but that's, that's a steep grade. So that would have been some work getting these guns up here. All right, got another Japanese coastal defense gun here. And uh, this looks to be the same as the other, another 14 centimeter gun. Looks like we have something a little bit different with this one though. With the first gun, it was uh, set in, in like, uh, an earthen embankment. Uh, this one has had a concrete wall poured around it. So whenever the Americans landed, like in, in Saipan, uh, they weren't expected to land until like November. Uh, even the Americans had planned on landing in, in November and then it ended up getting bumped up to June. So the, the Japanese defenders weren't quite ready for the Americans whenever they, they got here, and we're still kind of hastily building these fortifications. But uh, the one for this gun looks to have been, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was fully completed, but it looks certainly more complete than the others. All right, one more to go. Well, I won't lie, on the way in, I completely walked by gun number two because it has fallen over and is sitting over here in the brush. So if we get in here, we can get a little bit closer look at it. Um, yeah, this one, this one is a little worse off than, than what the other two were. Uh, but anyway, those, those are the three uh, PD guns here on Guam. Uh, and to my knowledge, I think that these guns are the only ones that are still in their original emplacement from 1944. That was the PD gun battery here uh, on the island of Guam. Now, something else of note about these guns is that they were completely silent throughout the Battle of Guam. They, they never fired. And the reason why is a bit of a mystery. Uh, I've heard one hypothesis that uh, the Japanese just weren't prepared and uh, while the guns were here, they weren't ready to fire. I've heard another possible hypothesis that uh, the Chamora people may have done some some sabotage work uh, but whatever the case uh, the 9th Infantry Regiment moved into this area on July 22nd and the regimental reports don't even mention a gun battery but uh, anyway that's it's gonna be probably one of history's mysteries but uh, that was the gun battery here at Petey on the island of Guam <laughs>